Hello, and welcome to the D2C podcast. I'm Eric Dick. It is sunny out in Victoria, so I'm going to try something a little different today. I fed in my interview with Eli Weiss from Jones Road Beauty to chat GPT and asked it to spit out its intro. So here's what it had to say. Get ready to dive into the world of personal branding, content creation, and customer experience in this thought-provoking interview with Eli Weiss from Jones Road Beauty. Discover the cringy allure of following the trends, the rise of volume-driven content, and the potential impact of AI. Learn why authentic connections and real value matter more than ever. Join the conversation on balancing efficiency and personalization, the power of human touch and business and the secrets to creating meaningful customer experiences. Don't miss the insights on tools for CX, the art of balancing AOV and LTV, and the role of enlightened hospitality in e-commerce. Tune in for a captivating exploration of personalized experiences, team structures, and the everlasting quest for customer loyalty. It's time to challenge the tradition, adopt strategic thinking, and unlock innovative ways to enhance your brand's customer experience journey. Pretty good, ChatGPT. Hope you enjoy this one with Eli Weiss, one of my faves, on with the show. I think at its core, retail is so interesting because for most people, it's this one three-minute experience that will define their entire journey with us. For a lot of customers, it's their first touch point. And they haven't seen a million ads. They probably heard about it from a friend. Online, we just have this like eloquent, long journey where they come from the ad, they take the quiz, they check out the PDP, the website, the shipping, the delivery, versus retail is just this one pivotal moment. Um, They walk in, the smile on the face of the person helping them, the conversation, the way that conversation flows, it just happens so quickly. But the stakes are super high, right? Like a great retail experience makes you fall in love with the brand. And we see that from reviews where people had a great retail experience. It's, it's mind blowing. Are you a Shopify brand owner looking to win, keep and grow your customers? Everyone knows apps are fast becoming the best way to increase retention and boost sales. A sleek and engaging app normally means two things, time and money. But App Tile have changed the game. Their seamless no-code editor enables beautiful, personalized journeys for every customer. And with their free plan, nothing is stopping you from getting started. You'll pay as you grow, not as you go. So whether you're just starting out or a Shopify superstar, head over to apptile.com today and start designing your dream app. Welcome to the D2C podcast. I'm super happy to have you back. I've not been here in a minute. It has been a minute. Um, I've just, uh, put your Twitter handle into chat GPT and I've asked it to come up with uh, all of the best questions, uh, from your Twitter handle. And they were all kind of garbage, actually. They were not, they were just kind of like, it was just like, what's best practices and blah, blah, blah. Like it doesn't know that Eli's returning guests and that we already have killer rapport. I saw your tweet about the top 10 ways to get to nine figures and all the people like, yeah, just put up your head. I was like, I wanted that. Everyone wanted that so bad, but you're like, no, it was a shit post. I, I've, I've never had so much fun. I don't know what it is. It's, I. It's a weird phenomenon, right? That people see that everyone's doing the same thing that they're doing and they're still so okay with it being cringy and bubbly and weird that we just continue yeah. doing it, right? And it's like, if you ask any of these people, like, how weird is this? Six months ago, they'd be like, this is the weirdest thing ever. But today they're all doing it because like at the end of the day, we want growth. It's, it's interesting because I think about this a lot in the realm of like my career, right? Where like shortcuts are just... They never last. They, they just never last. Yeah. Having 150,000 followers that are just here for your like same shit every single day that's just like chat GPT-esque, yeah. it's just not, it just doesn't feel real to me. Um, so I have a good time doing it. And yeah, and the cost of content is going to zero. The cost of like non-original content, like I still feel like we just launched our Avant Post, this like big long editorial piece and we've got... We're kind of really investing in, in content that's harder to replicate, but who knows how long until all the cost of content all goes to zero. It's going to be interesting. I think a lot of this is like the conversation around AI, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but I think a lot of it is just fascinating because it's everyone knows that everyone is using this. But for some reason, we know it's cringy, but we have this like, especially marketers, I think we, we're just so, what's the word for it? Like we're just... We just don't see it when it's in our own when it's in our own house. Um, we don't eat our dog food that much. And it's, <laughs> yes. I can, I can, or enough. It's funny. We we're talking about that with some of the way we've marketed D 2 C. Like we probably haven't practiced all that we've preached 
on the DTC yeah. podcast in some ways. And and I think people just people just make it up in volume. They just know that the universe doesn't care. Like, I, you know, I, I can think of a couple friends that post all the time and every time I'm like, well, you'd never talk like this in person. Like this wouldn't be, you know, but but it's it's interesting to think about. Like we were just thinking about the attention game because we were just did a podcast last week about sludge content. Mm -hmm. And we saw, you know, when you just put, uh, you know, a video on the bottom, we're going to do it to this one. We're going to sludge the hell out of the clips on this one. And we get, we get 10 X the views on, on that. The question is, is that quality? You know what I mean? If we're just creating like cognitive Velcro with people, like, is yeah. that actually a value in this ecosystem? It's a tremendous cognitive dissonance. That's the word I was looking for. Um, it's weird that on one hand, we know that product is important to have like real value education, we need real value, content, we need real value. But when it comes to your own personal brand, you just throw, throw sludge at the ceiling. Um, you know, with TikTok, I think TikTok probably started it where it was just a content game. It was just volume, right? It was a volume game. But now it's like, it's come to LinkedIn and then it's come to Twitter and it's just like, you know, reply, I need this uh, and must be following for DM. It's, it's, yeah. it's like so cringe on one hand, I get it. Like personal brand is important. It helps you, you know, like it helps you hire people it helps you get paid like there's so many great values like personal brand changed my life i think people don't quite realize and i i see this from the newsletter and from the like sponsor tweet side people don't realize that when i look at other people in the space that have a hundred plus thousand followers like i'm actually getting paid more than them on a per tweet or per newsletter basis because of the vol like the volume game doesn't actually help when it's when when you're talking about getting paid because yeah. your engagement is crap right like yeah. reply for DM, whatever, like that just doesn't, it doesn't hold off. A lot of this is like relevant to customer experience and, and retention as well. But I, I will go down the rabbit hole because I, it's funny. I had, I just posted on one of your comments about, about courses and, you know, I have produced courses, put courses out there and it's an, in, it's a really interesting position because I understand the sentiment that like, oh my God, here's another course. But I would say at the same time, almost every marketer I know started with some lame course, you know, and it like, it's, it's an interesting uh, parallel. I think that courses is like anything else. When somebody like Alex Hermosi will put out a course, right? It's like this, this person has built his own thing, right? If you're yes. an agency and you're putting out a course, this is the thing that I've done that has built my ex. That's fine with me. But when you're like, a copywriter that does copy for nobody and it's just like you watch one Ty Lopez course now you have a copy agency or you're a drop shipper and you're just like if you haven't done it and you're teaching people how to do it that to me is is obscene that's like me putting out a growth marketing course tomorrow and saying like I learned from chat GGB, jet chat GPT and this is like the course to take yeah. I think with that it's like everything else right it's like you find people that are great at x and all of a sudden they're putting out a course on y I think the the attention thing is just like it's a slow spiral to the ground, right? It's just like yeah. build yeah. authentic connections with both your people in your professional environment as well as with your customers with CX. You're you're one of the leading CX lights in the in the space. I had Jess Servalon on uh, a couple of weeks ago. She was uh, fantastic as well. And I, I just saw I was pulling some stuff off your your Twitter th myself uh, your Twitter feed. I saw your I, I saw you promote another newsletter called No Best Practices, and that really resonated with me. I haven't actually heard the podcast, but I think that's such a. We were talking about that this morning. We were talking about how to format the newsletter, and and it's like we're in this really interesting space where it's it, you you can get bogged down looking at like what other people have done all the time, but really we're in the game. Like the the real leverage comes when you're able to create your own best practices from from your data. I imagine is that something you try to do. Yeah, but, uh, well, on, on both points. Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words. Um, I think that CX is this strange world where people that are good at it are usually like quiet. CX people, like we're not very outgoing. So I think it's weird to have like any voice in this space. The, the voices, like the quote unquote voices in CX are, are 50, 60, 70 year olds. So I call <laughs> it like the new guard versus the old guard, right? So there's, yeah. there's not a lot of people that are talking about CX and, and Jess is one of the few, right? There's Jess, there's Zoe, and there's a few others that have started talking about it. And it's like everything else where I actually welcome as many people as I possibly can. I, I've intro people to you to get, get them on the podcast because I want more yeah. voices in CX. Alex G, Alex Grayfield is one of the people that I've met that's kind of on this retention slash growth um you know has worked with brands like tapestry and a bunch of really cool fashion brands um and she is just a real real voice in this space that has brought a lot of energy into my thinking around retention and, and i think the no best practices piece is interesting because like you said yeah we copy we we call d to c like d to c as the vertical so whether you're selling diapers or like 
supplements or skincare, you're all kind of D to C. And I think a lot of this comes to just looking at what works, quote unquote, works for somebody else. Um, you're like, well, athletic greens, like they obviously test it 500 ways. So if it works on their side, it obviously works on mine. And then again, cognitive dissonance on like, well, maybe it doesn't work because like my traffic is shit, or maybe it doesn't work because my copy is shit. And we just copy paste. A lot of this kind of came to boil with the whole Glossier thing a couple of weeks ago. Everyone's like, Glossier's new site is shit. All the CRO voices in the universe came out and they were like, this is like objectively horse horse shit like this is objectively the worst thing ever touched and i think alex g was again a voice in the room where it's like both of those things can be true right it can be true that you need that glossier needs to do a better job in x y and z but it can also be true that glossier has a brand that's so fucking strong that if it takes an extra half a second to find the add to cart they'll still do just fine so i think we we've just we've just we've deduced direct consumer slash commerce to the things that work while sucking out all of the life and everything else, right? So it's like, does this work or doesn't it work? And brand is not valuable. Experience is not valuable because, again, it's deduced down to, like, the margin cost and the efficiency and everything's just a numbers game. And when you do that, you end up outsourcing your CX. You end up finding chat GPT to answer all your customer questions and you rant about it on Twitter. You end up outsourcing your everything in the business to, like, these fractional whatevers. You end up taking boxes that cost 10 cents instead of spending an extra 25 cents and making it an elevated experience. I think that's what's slowly happening, right? We're just like taking, we're taking the life out of everything. What are some ways, are there, are there some ways that you've, so, so correct me if I'm, so is that your goal as, is, as, as head of CX? Cause you, you're someone that also, you know, you talk a lot about the personal touch. Um, and I'm curious, like what are some ways that you've thrown out the playbook a little bit uh, with Jones Road? Is there anything that, that comes to mind? Yeah, I think w when it comes to thinking about uh, efficiency, efficiency is always like the, the number one word that CX people absolutely hate because it usually means like, let's cut corners again. Uh, when it comes to human connection, I'm inspired by so many of the hospitality, you know, like setting the table and just hospitality folks in general that they invest so much money into experience. And, and obviously, you know, Chad will be screaming from the next door like, well, that's IRL. It's obviously not the same. Well, the, the whole universe is changing, and I think people can, can easily realize what a invested experience feels like versus something that you just went for the cheapest kind of last scraps of the, of the barrel. Um, when, I, when I think about like best practices that I'm trying to get rid of is I'm, is I'm trying to think of more than just today. So I think when, when you think about our shade matching, which I spoke about in the last episode, right, where you know, traditionally people will be like, what? I'm just going to look for the fastest response time. That's what like KPIs for CX are. How fast can you respond? one touch solution, as many tickets per agent as you possibly can, and just go for speed, 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 and efficiency. And what Sounds we saw- Sounds like healthcare in Canada, by the way. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> That's All right. So instead of going for efficiency, just brutal efficiency, we went for yep. this kind of middle ground and, and taking a little bit longer of a, of a uh, you know, instead of looking at today and tomorrow, we're looking six months. I think when it comes to like the other flip side of, of you know, again, a, like a no best practices thought process is around AI, right? Like there's going to, and, and we can get in that more detail, but there will be a time where the monotonous, boring, where's my order type shit, you know, outside of the wonderment solution, there's going to be a time where the same boring questions get answered by a robot. That's fine. When Soon. you go to, when you go to either extreme and you know what my hot take for this episode, it'll come after you growth marketers too, right? Because with yeah. performance oh, yeah. max and, you know, and, and, and Meta's Advantage Plus, we're heading in the same direction where your job is not to set cost caps. Your job is to just click start and click stop. And all the people like, hey, have you seen Facebook is spending more money today? Like, you won't touch that in, in a year or two. And again, we end up to the same reality where everyone will be focused on the things that they can massively impact and leave alone everything that you can't. When it comes to CX, that's having this AI kind of middle ground on all the Hey, where's my order? Hey, does this product work work with why? And then focusing incredibly strongly on the things that you can make an impact, like surprise and delight. Something that happened that went really wrong. Um, how can a human jump in? And we see that with hospitality, but again, we're like, oh well, that's hospitality. Those people are different people. They have different hearts. They have different feelings. 
what does it mean? Like when you say you're looking at your customers now from six months, like practically, what, what does that mean in terms of like either your dashboards or like your initiatives? How, how does that translate when you're not looking at just sort of, cause I could just imagine on a help desk, it's like, there's a real temptation just sort of like to, you know, get your inbox down to zero, but how are you organizationally having your whole team think about it differently? On a very practical level, instead of looking at AOV as like the the final number, we're looking at six-month LTV or three-month LTV as a, as a very, very important number, right? And, and shade matching is that, is that one perfect example where we're seeing that, you know, maybe they spend a little bit more when they're shade matched. They, they actually spend a lot more. But even if they spent around the same much on a six-month window, it's, you know, it's double or triple. Um, so we're, we're trying to like, okay, if these shade match customers are, are really valuable, how do we talk to them differently? And then again, it, it boils down to like when we're launching a new product, can we reach out to these people that we shade matched uh, with an email from the person that shade matched them saying like, hey, it's me again. Uh, if you don't remember, I helped you six months ago. We actually launched, launched this new product. That'll be perfect for you. Um, if you have dry skin or if you have oily skin, like this is perfect for you with a little, you know, like that's kind of what works well in, in, in retail, right? Like this personal, like personal concierge type of shopping, personal shopper experience, clienteling, right? Like you see that in Bloomingdale's and Saks, but D2C brands haven't done clienteling. They haven't had like, this is your customer, right? SaaS companies have done it because they're looking more holistically as like, oh, each customer is worth so much. D2C brands, if, even if a customer is only worth $1,000 over their lifetime and not 10, you can, you can figure the efficiency out there, right? Maybe the email is a plain text email that comes from the person they spoke to. We've been lazy because we've looked at an order and a ticket and not holistic humans. Um, I think that'll change as we kind of like use AI to find efficiency. That's a really interesting concept of just like having these. And again, it would be the middle ground. It wouldn't be full AI where you're getting random messages and just weird images. But the AI, I'm sure, would be helping determining the scheduling and when everything gets done. But you just have that human touch to, to claim the middle ground. We're seeing the swing, right? Like we're seeing the pendulum swing from side to side. And, and it's always like the people that are looking to save money that are very, very, very eager to jump in and be like, I'm a front runner. You're not a front runner when it costs an extra $10. You're a front runner, front runner when you save an extra 10 bucks. I think being cautious, again, like, you know, when you think about the brands that are excited about AI and moving forward AI, those are the brands that don't have much to lose. Either their experience is not anything substantial today, so they don't have much to lose, or they're not very large. The large brands are not giving away all their customer support to, to AI tomorrow. And again, even brands that have outsourced, right? Like I, I talk, and, and you know my feelings about outsourcing, but I, I talk to large brands that outsource and it's like, even, you know, even the, the brands that outsource have multiple redundancies. Like some of them have multiple BPOs. Some of them have an internal team and a BPO. Like large companies move strategically. Even if you're a startup, you want to be strategic. So we'll, we'll move really, really slowly and strategically towards that direction, but we're not going to be naive, right? Like we, we understand that that's where we're going. With humans at the heart of it, driving it, uh, which yeah. I think is the goal. You can't just pass it off. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned launching products, and I saw that you'd launched fragrance, and I just like, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't wear a lot of fragrances, but that fragrance sounds amazing. Like you just stepped out of the shower with the citrus notes and all, all the wonders stuff. How has it gone going from uh, makeup into fragrance? Or had you already, is this the first fragrance? This is the first fragrance. So Bobby has launched fragrance way earlier in her career, um, and Bobby loves fragrance. I think, I think what people don't quite understand is is how close she is to copy and and ideation. And and this is the way that she describes fragrance. Right? It's like this smells like I'm walking out of the shower, and it's like, oh, that's perfect. And that goes on the product page. Um, but it was it was a blast. I think it's you know launching any new category, you're not quite sure how it'll, how it'll do and. And it absolutely crushed. It sold out in less than a week, and, and we anticipated it would last a, a lot longer than that. Um, it was just like so a pre-sale too, right? It was like you had a sample, you had like a, a, a number of samples. It was a great way to do a pre-launch. So this was kind of like we we have the the actual fragrance launching at the end of the year, and and Bobby said, "Fuck it, I want to get some." She saw it in the lab bottle, and she's like, "Why don't we just sell some like this?" Um, and she pulled as many as she possibly could, and and pulled it up towards the beginning of the year, and and we launched it. It's, it's kind of like this lab sample fragrance. Um, you know, the, there was an article in Ink Magazine that's in print, actually, that, you know, talks about this. And, you know, the Bobby's always been this way. Like, right when we launched, we, had, we were running out of packaging. And it talks about how, like, she just put them in Ziploc bags with a card. Um, she doesn't, doesn't get told 
this doesn't work. She figures a way around it. So it's, it's been a journey. No best practices. No best Straight practices, up. right? It's like, that's, yeah. It's, you're, yeah, that's really cool. when you've got such an iconic founder driving things at this point. Yeah, it's been fun. And, and congrats on that. Inc. What does it, what does Bobby on Inc. do for the business? Does it, is, do you, will, will you see, did you see a big boost? Is it something you're, you're seeing on the CX side? I have been so busy today that I, I can't yeah. even answer that. I've not, I've not checked. Um, but you know, Bobby is, is, is a legendary founder. Um, and it's, you know, we, we have so many customers that have been with us, you know, have been with Bobby for 20, 30 years. Um, and it, it, it's, it's creates such a strong moat for a brand and it's such a strong brand having these relationships, right? Like relationships are core to any brand. Um, having people that have, you know, people reach out like, Hey, I've been following Bobby since I'm a teenager and I met her at this beauty counter and whatever. Um, and I'm so excited about this launch. So it's, it's been such a fun journey. Will you, will you send that into, in any of your content? Will you sort of say, Hey, Bobby's been featured in, uh, in, in anything? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the relationship with, with ink on this was. Um, yeah. so I'm not, I'm not even sure. Might be, might even work in ads. Uh, yeah. nice. Want to delight your customers so they keep coming back for more? Tidio, the highest rated customer experience software on Shopify, helps online businesses gain and retain customers with personalized shopping experiences. With Tidio, you can recommend products and offer discounts based on user behavior and order history without leaving the chat widget. Tidio also takes the pressure off your support team. The app enables you to manage all your communication channels in one dashboard and automate up to 47% of recurring questions using AI. Increase customer satisfaction in sales with personalized shopping experiences. Visit tidio.com slash DTC and get an exclusive 20% discount for D2C podcast listeners. That's T-I-D-I-O dot com slash DTC. Super cool. I saw something, another post that you mentioned just about, and this is just a fairly simple practice about geo-targeting your list uh, towards retail launches. And I just wanted to ask, hey, how, how strong is, this is just a question from my personal standpoint, like, do you have geographical data based on IP on every single user? And is that, do you consider that really accurate data? It's directionally accurate. So Clavio has, you know, most customers. Um, it's directionally accurate, meaning like obviously somebody can have three homes or somebody can be yeah. traveling or somebody can, you know, have installed an email or used an email when they live in one place and live in another. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's mostly IP and it, I, I think it kind of goes back to our core thinking around human experiences versus just like spray and pray email. So, so we think about, you know, like we're now in this omni-channel universe where we have these retail locations, we have our customers are buy online. All the retail locations are owned retail locations. So we have the store in New York and the store in New Jersey. And we've just been thinking about marketing in this more holistic way. Um, and part of that is, okay, we sold fragrance out online. We still have a couple hundred in each store. How do we have these communications with the customer? So most brands were just, okay, let's fucking send it. Versus, you know, the way Joanne at Jones is thinking about it is like, okay, but we better exclude the people that have already purchased online. Um, we should probably, you know, think about, should it be five miles versus 10 miles? Would people want to travel for this? So when we're, we, when we're creating this geo target, how many people do we want to send it to looking at previous, you know, we're also using Shopify POS so we can see people that purchased in store as well. So we're seeing this overarching journey, but maybe people that have purchased in retail earlier, you know, those are kind of stronger people to send it to. So it's been, it's been fun. It's new to me. Uh, prior to this, I was at Olipop where we had no owned retail. So this is all new and fun and different. Um, CX in retail is also new and fun and different for me. Um, you know, we did a CX training, um, myself and, and, and Sydney on the CX team. We did a, a CX training with our retail locations, which again is fascinating because I wouldn't last a day in retail. Um, but it's been fun to kind of translate the same values we have on D2C. Uh, yeah. What does that mean? Get, get, like, what is a, what is a Jones Road Beauty uh, D2C value that translates to, to retail? I think at its core, retail is so interesting because for most people, it's this one three-minute experience that will define their entire journey with us. For a lot of customers, it's their first touch point, and they haven't seen a million ads. They probably heard about it from a friend. So online, we just have this, like, eloquent long journey where they come from the ad they take the quiz they go you know they check out the p 
PDP, the website, the shipping, the delivery versus retail is just this one pivotal moment. Um, they walk in, the smile on the face of the person helping them, the conversation, the way that conversation flows. I think it, it just happens so quickly. Um, but the stakes are super high, right? Like a great retail experience makes you fall in love with a brand. And we see that from reviews where people had a great retail experience. It's, it's mind blowing. Um, so a lot of it is focused on like the, the way that we, you know, we elaborate on what the experience could be versus what it looks like when it doesn't go well. Um, we talk about de-escalation. I think that's, you know, our stores, all of them, or actually both of them, including our, the, you know, our counter in Liberty London, like they're all very busy all the time. Um, and it's like, how do you set expectations? So something we do on, on D2C that we're constantly obsessed with is like, if it takes four days to deliver, should we say five? If it takes 48 hours to ship, should we say two to three days? Like, how do we set expectations? Um, and a lot of that translates to retail a little differently, right? Like if you have 30 people waiting, how do you set expectations? Something we kicked off or we're kicking off this week at Liberty. Um, we just kicked off like a QR code where you can add yourself to a line, kind of like the lounge, you know, ear, ear, uh, the airport lounges have where if it's very busy, you scan a QR code. Um, so we're just thinking about like, if it's super cold outside or if it's super hot outside at our Montclair store and we don't have space in the store, can we have cold drinks for these people? Can we set expectations around how long it should take? Um, so it's been interesting because it's obviously slightly different than in sending an email or replying to an email, but it's been fun. Really cool. Especially, and it's a unique retail experience too, it sounds like. It's like to have it so boutique, right? And focused on one-to-one, -one, you know, cosmetic <laughs> intervention, it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, we try to kind of the same thing we're doing online, we try to do in retail. Um, and Bobby, yeah. you know, has a really strong part of the way the stores get set up and the way the stores are, the way all the counters are, you know, merchandising and all that fun stuff. Um, a part of it is like, you know, how do you hire people that feel on brand with Jones? We're kind, we're, we're helpful. We educate our consumers. We're patient. You know, like how do you, how do you kind of like strategically and thoughtfully upsell? And what that means on D2C is obviously like, where would the customer be heading if I wouldn't say a word, right? Where would they be heading next based on the quiz data, based on their purchase data? And we try to do the same thing in retail, um, you know, like thoughtfully upsell. And that's kind of the difference. I, I talk about this sometimes on Twitter, the difference between like cringe and, and gross upselling versus thoughtful upselling is like the cringe upselling is like, you have 10 seconds to purchase this or it self explodes. Um, the thoughtful upselling is we notice you told us this on your quiz. We notice you bought this statistically based on what we've seen across the rest of our customers, you have a very high chance of buying this. So it's, it's almost like predictive repurchase, not timing, predictive repurchase, what's or predictive next purchase, which nobody's done, right? There are no tools that do that yet. That's interesting. That takes, I'm sure that's being built right now. Some, a dynamic, CX journey piece. What, what are you using right now? Like what are there? You mentioned, you know, we talked about your stance on AI and being, you know, using it modelly. Are there any tools that you are finding really useful right now for, for your job? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we, we've been using, when I joined Jones, um, we were using a different like NPS tool at, at Olipop and it was super expensive. So I literally Googled like NPS tool and went through like 30 of them and found one um, called Retently. And it's this this guy based in, in Europe and he was like, D2C, that sounds cool. Um, and it's been a blast using it. It's fantastic. Um, we use Octane obviously for quizzes, which is sensational. Um, and then outside What's of the that, AI like, element of that, what's the AI element in Octane? So Octane, their quiz building is really getting strategic around AI, like leveraging cool. your customer data to better understand what to kind of suggest them. But that's mostly pre-purchase. Where, you know, like the, the rebuys of the world and the zipifies of the world do very well at predicting what the best case for a strong AOV is, right? Like they do very well predicting like 50% of customers choose this when we try to upsell them. So let's upsell mascara or what, you know, the everything brush on every order. What they haven't quite figured out yet is the like, not what most customers would buy tomorrow, but what makes for a really strong LTV? Like what makes not for a really strong AOV today, but what makes for a really strong customer journey? For example, like we know that people that buy our mascara or our best pencil, like those are our strong customers. So we obviously want to suggest that pretty early on. But if you used like a upsell tool, that wouldn't necessarily tell you that because even though maybe a little bit 
you know, lower percentage of people might select that today, the people that do select that are much stronger over the long period of time. And then you have to do the math. Like, is it, do you want like strong money today versus a lot more money tomorrow? And you'll ask four people, you get four different responses. Both. Um, most, we want both. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> and that's true. And most marketers will be like, well, money today, always money today because like inflation. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like without a cost. Though, yeah. have you seen? Have you like? Do you see that borne out in the data that the more aggressive you are up front, the lower the LTV tends to be? Not necessarily. I think what the data tells us is that for certain customers, like the people that have these certain characteristics early on, those customers are you can send as many messages as you want, and they will continue purchasing. And obviously, like good email strategy is helpful. Good SMS strategies is strategies are helpful. It doesn't make somebody wealthier. Right? Like people only have X amount of disposable income. Now, you know, I think we mentioned this last time, but like our goal is to take away money at Olipop. Our goal is like to take away money from like the organic ketchup and instead spend it on Olipop. With this, it's like maybe take away money from what you would spend in, in a competitor's universe and spend it with us. Or instead of, you know, what, I, what you know, we're basically taking money from one space and bringing it here. Um, we did a, a, really fun project with Alex G around kind of like a, a retention dive. And then we learned, you know, a lot of these characteristics early on are like the, the, the width, like the, the amount of categories wide a customer goes in their first order is an indicator. Um, the amount of like, obviously the AOV is an indicator. So when you have those indicators, the, the ideal best case scenarios go hard on those customers and the people that we know are statistically maybe not our kind of like VIPs, top 10%, be strategic. Don't go too hard because you're, you're probably just going to get them to unsubscribe. But, you know, like that's, that's kind of the question is like based on statistical data that we've seen in the past, like how do we get these people through their journey to spend a lot of money but also have a great experience and not scare them away? And the incentives are misaligned, right? So if you talk to the agency guy – that's sending emails, he'll tell you like, my data tells me the more emails I send to the more people, that's how much money I make. And again, that, that might not be wrong, right? That's, that's, the, that's the fucked up part is like, that might be right that the more emails you send, the more money you make because within that group of 100,000 people that are getting the email, there's a large portion that would have been your VIP customers that would purchase anyway. The other people, you're scaring, you're scaring away. So you're still getting that core group of people that would be spending the money. I think that's kind of like, they can all be right, but if you want to, if you want to optimize for like a lot of money and a good customer experience, you need to be thinking holistically about the journey you put these people on. So your VIPs, you're kind of like going hard, right? But thoughtfully hard, meaning like a bunch of emails, but that are educational, helpful, have a thoughtful upsell on the bottom, um, are actually a net positive for them, not spam. And then the people that you know are kind of on this longer tail journey, you're still sending them emails. You're kind of spacing it a little bit more, you know, I, I think that's the middle ground, which, again, incentives are so misaligned. So you'll never hear this from anyone unless it's a one person, not one person, unless it's like all internal. But it also, but yeah, it, you have then the opportunity potentially to warm them up into that other class of customer potentially. Whereas like, I'm sure there's a, there is a whole category of people in that second category that are maybe on the fence a little bit and you will, and you know, you might lose them forever if you, if you have the same, the same approach with, with, uh, with your email there. I wanted to ask also about yeah. So I don't know if you can speak to this. Uh, I don't know if you're under embargo, but I just I saw that Cody was testing uh, some of the new Shopify checkouts. Do you have any? Do you have visibility into into those experiments? Can you can you comment on any of that? I can comment and say that it's been it's been strong for us. I think that you know the the broader ideology here is that the more steps you can remove from a thoughtful customer like a, a customer purchase journey, the better. Um, I think it's like, it's so fascinating to me because when you think about the fasts of the world, right, the $5 hoodies and the bolts and all these other kind of companies that were doing basically what shop pay was doing, but they were like across the whole internet and blah, blah, blah. It's again, kind of this middle ground, right? Whereas if you just put in your information once and click one button and purchase everywhere, that's obviously not the best case scenario. I mean, Apple pay is like slowly, Apple pay shop pay are slowly kind of bringing that into the normal customer the way a customer thinks, right? If you just looked at something and you purchased it, like in some sci-fi movie, I think there would be a weird, like friction is important. A little bit of friction is important for somebody to learn about the product they're purchasing. That's why we send people to a quiz, right? Yeah. Because we want people to feel like, and, and people are like, 
most of your audience goes through a quiz? Yes, because these people are purchasing something that we want it to look good on them. So even if they say no, well, here's your $38, we don't want that. We want to make sure that you take this $38 and buy a Miracle Bomb that fits and looks and feels perfect for you, understanding how to use it. I think that's kind of, again, this middle ground where you want some sort of friction and a journey, but maybe checkout can be on one page um, versus like next, next, next for shipping and billing. So I think it's kind of what we're, that was our hypothesis going into it. And it's, it's proving to be strong, but I think it's, it's fascinating to understand the, the customer kind of buying behavior psychology where too, too little friction is not actually helpful, um, but it's just the right amount. Speaking of no friction, it reminds me of this chat that we did with David Sangara, who has a number of brands. He's, he's very aggressively grown some, some incredible e- e-commerce brands. He spoke at Northbeam's panel, and he gave a tip to the audience about using one-click upsells in emails. I think he's able to do it via headless commerce. But like in terms of like friction-free experiences, like I fit, that's one that would be right on that line of like you'd probably make a ton of sales, but you might, not, you might have some bad customer experiences from people that didn't fully get what they were doing. I think that's what it is, right? It's it's all an education piece. Like we we've seen, like there's a ton of like post purchase upselling now, right? We we tried some at Olipop. Rebuy does that. There's a bunch of tools that do that. Um, where it's like, you know, I think like native, like Moise was doing this at Native way way back, right? With the with the travel size, um, and I think you know they all have like a ticking time bomb exploding situation, and they all say like limited quantity available, and and they all kind of do a similar thing. I think it's always like the beginning of any new customer kind of like switch is always the hardest. And as we kind of get used to it, like a good example of that was defaulting to subscription two years ago, people absolutely hated it. I think I, you know, I'm talking to brands like I'm invested in Huron, the skincare, and they were talking about like they do it and they hardly get any complaints. So I think you're seeing like this, like, you know, as customer journey, like as well, as customers kind of like get used to, new and interesting and different strategies, their thoughts around it can change. Um, But it's always a beginning that's like changing customer perception is not one guy on his Shopify store, right? I think that's like the key. And and there's so much like there are the front runners. I was watching Ezra Firestone, um, a video on like LinkedIn where he was talking about like all of his PDPs, like the, the big bold headers are not the product name. They're like a product description. And it's like, and it does very well for him, right? So they're, they're the front runners that learn this and find it out. And then, you know, that might be a thing in two years where people actually put their, their subheader as the actual name of the product and their header is like what the product does for you. I think it's, it's interesting. I'm like more of a, I'd like somebody else to prove that, uh, prove that out and kind of like there, there are plenty of things on the CX realm that I'm a front runner or excited about, but not so much on like the, the risky ones, but. Yeah. Ezra, just keep on trailblazing for us, buddy. Uh, what, a, what a great guy that Ezra Firestone is. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask also, I saw you had a post up about Shake Shack, uh, about meeting the, I guess, one of the founders of, of Shake Shack or the founder. And I was curious, when Jess came on, she had a lot to talk about how, um, you know, SaaS companies, how much, how much CPG brands can learn from SaaS companies when it comes to CX. Is there, is it, you know, you, you've sort of, you, you idolize, uh, I forget his, Mr. Meyer there from Shake Shack. Uh, what what have you taken from from his business journey that you've applied to, to yours? Yeah, I Jess and I talk about this very often about kind of like what SaaS can learn. I think SaaS has come a long way. Like customer success manager was a thing in SaaS, making six figures before CX had its like moment. Um, is setting the table is a book by Danny Meyer, who, like you said, is is a founder of of Shake Shack and and is a founder of Levin Madison Union Square Hospitality Group, which has a bunch of, uh, you know, fine dining restaurants in New York. I think a lot of this, like my excitement around setting the table was, you know, the way Danny Meyer thinks about enlightened hospitality. Um, and, the, and, you know, the two, my two favorite things are enlightened hospitality and the 51% rule. Enlightened hospitality is essentially like focus on your team, focus on your people and the rest, everything else comes after that. So creating a place where people feel like the work they're doing is, is changing lives um, and everything comes after that, the, you know, the, the profits and the investors and even the customers, um, you, you know, so, so putting an emphasis on people. Um, the 51% rule is, is one of my kind of like things that I've pulled into the way I hire, which is almost, you know, 49% of your work, the tactical stuff is very easy to learn. I didn't know a thing about kind of like the practical 
CX, like how to use Gorgeous or how to whatever, X, Y, and Z. I didn't know my way around Clavio a few years ago. I have no education. I learned everything on the job. The thing that nobody could have taught me is the EQ and the empathy piece of like just slowing down and putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So I think that's like the 51% rule is like you need an extra 1% of that EQ side and the tactical like you can always figure out. So when it comes to like hospitality, setting the table is, a, is about a million of these stories where they broke the script, right? Like somebody shows up to an event um, at the restaurant or shows up to the restaurant and they say, oh, uh, where are you parked? And the guy says, oh, the meter, I have 90 minutes. And you know, throughout dinner, they run out every 90 minutes and put put more money in the meter, just like thinking about these things that most people don't, you know, somebody left their tickets to an event at home when they were eating at 11 Madison and, and, and the team ran to this person's house to pick up the tickets so they can have an iconic, perfect dinner at this, you know, Michelin star restaurant. So I think it's a lot of the things we think about hospitality and we tell ourselves like, Oh, that's IRL. Like these are where experiences are made. But when people buy something online, they're expecting for everything to break and for us to blame UPS. And I think that there's a lot of like, I think we're slowly seeing that. And actually AI is pushing this further where when everything is automated, those little moments of sanity of like beautiful experiences are highlighted even more. Um, I just purchased a gift for our, our friend Nate Rosen um, for his wedding registry. And I placed an order um, and as I click place order with shop pay, I'm like, fuck, that was my old address. Um, and I reached out and three minutes later, I get a response from a human saying like, oh, that's such a thoughtful gift. I just updated the address. And I'm like, that's incredible. Um, AI might be able to do that. Um, what AI won't be able to do is see that somebody is having surgery and send them a blanket with a card that was sent from Jones Road. Auto GPT <laughs> might be able to do it. And here are seven reasons <laughs> <laughs> why auto GPT nice. will yeah you, what, you, but what do they have to do they have to comment they have to reply to this podcast and must they be have following. to say must be yeah. following uh, you got to give me five star rating too you got to give you got to go right now give me a five star rating it's, yeah. it's the, the new gentleman's agreement uh yes. and then eli will drop his top 10 ways to get to nine figures how many tickets do you have today how many tickets are you guys rocking a day these days i mean we have like a good thirty thousand tickets a month give or take wow it's yeah. a lot of tickets. Well, and I just, I also just, as one last question, I just want to ask you, what does your team look like at this point? Yeah. Um, our team is, you know, like we have like six ish full time and a couple of part time. Um, you know, CX at this current moment is also community. So, you know, it's the DMs, it's the comments on social. Um, you know, as, as we continue to grow, we're trying to give everyone kind of a corner. Um, to focus on. So it's not everyone doing everything. So we have, you know, V is very helpful on loop on all the returns type of stuff. Um, you know, we have Who's your people emails the- are, who's your emails are. Do you have someone who like really owns the technical side of email? Well, Joanne is Joanne, our, okay. I gotta, I gotta have Joanne yeah. on. I've never, I've heard, I hear you her mention so much. I gotta have Joanne. On. Joanne is, is one of the most incredible people I've met in my career. Um, so I mean, if I if I was as successful as as her at her age, um, I'd feel on top of the world. I mean, she she does everything. Jones Road. I mean, from she's often writing copy. She's jumping in in Figma and designing. Um, she is just a a one person. Uh, she she knows how to do everything. Um, not that she often has to, but if she did, she she can come up with an idea, write the copy, put the design together, you know, fuck around in Clavio and send. Um, just a, a, a great person as well. So I definitely recommend you have her on. Nice. Well, shout out Joanne. Let's uh, let's leave it there, man. This was a lot of fun. I look forward to having you back. I think uh, we're just about to launch Cody's today. I think, and so you guys can go head to head on on listens on the because we just got it. Uh, we got to unseat Nick Sharma until he comes back on. Uh, yeah, I listened to Cody's right before this episode. Um, oh, nice. And it was great. So. It was tactical. It was very in Cody's lane. It was giving all the all the tactical tips. So I, I think that'll do well. Nice. I'm glad we did these separate though because CX. You, you, no one puts Eli in the corner, and CX deserves <laughs> its <laughs> its own spotlight. That. Yeah. No, this was a lot of fun, man. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at direct to consumer all one word, dot co.
I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.